Okay, everyone. Um, <clears throat> today's lecture is about uh, time, section, and notation. The 20th century and its technological advancements in travel and communication sped up and fragmented our relationship with the built environment. If we understand the notion of the physical is perceptually blurred by our rate of travel, it is fair to say that our speeds and advances in the communication have largely dismantled uh, physical boundaries. The shift is represented in our quickly evolving global culture. The speed of communication is blending our world in a profound way. Part of that communication is the transcendent image, the cataloging of a moment. This fast paced based culture has had a significant impact on architecture and in many ways has become the standard for the representation of architecture. So in the age of the selfie, thinking about time and the cataloging of the moments of architecture seems particularly important. This notion of capturing time isn't new to architecture. In the Western world, the notion of cataloging and documenting time and space <clears throat> relationships was documented as early as in the 1300s, where we derived some of our terminology for cataloging information that we use today. Nicholas Oresme studied phenomena like light and heat, and he conceived of the idea of visual visualizing these concepts by using planes, <clears throat> approaching what we would now call rectangular coordinates. He applied this concept of the analysis of local motion where latitudo or intensity represented speed and longitudino represented time and the area of the figure represented the distance travel. The evolution of notation and drawing took place over a longer period of time. For instance, contours on plans, which we use to document changes in grade, are relatively new to drawing, only becoming commonplace with modes of communication in the Napoleonic era. Given this slow arc of evolution, the notation and documentation and understanding of time as it relates to a body of in space significantly changed in the latter part of the 19th century, fueled by the invention of the camera and the work of visionaries, notably Frank Gilbreth, Etienne Jules Marais, and Edward Muybridge. Murray, a pioneer in this work, began investigating external motion and the movement of bodies. Using ingenious and somewhat problematic recording devices, he studied the gaits of horses and humans and examined how birds and insects achieve flight. While Murray's graphical method continued to produce significant results, it had several distinct advantages when applied to the studies of bodies in motion. It required physical connection between the thing being measured and the recording device itself, a connection with, which oftentimes constrained the natural movements being studied. It was unable to record the changing positions of the bodies of the limbs <coughs> moving fr freely through space. While Murray would continue to use graphical methods for future experiments, after seeing Moybridge's photographs of the horse in motion, the possibility of using photography to extend the range of his investigations was too tempting to pass up. And these are some of his studies uh, calculated or basically uh, graphically depicting kind of plan section elevation of a bird in flight. <clears throat> Moybridge, Edward Moybridge, a photographer uh, with impo was important for his pioneering work in photographic studies of motion and motion picture projection. He used multiple cameras to capture motion in stop action photographs. <clears throat> he also developed devices for projecting motion pictures, in, uh, one of which was called the Zootraxiscope, which is considered the first uh, movie projector. In 1880s, Moybridge entered a very productive period uh, of his career at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, producing over 100,000 images of animals and humans in motion. <clears throat> capturing what the human eye could not distinguish uh, as separate movements. And these are uh, a cross section of some of his work. Inspired by Moybridge, Murray also developed tools for capturing motion, including, including the invention of the photo gun, which amplified his ability to ca catalog a body moving in space. And with these, he created his hybrid, hybrid drawings and photography, which became very uh, influential 
in the idea of notation and cataloging movement in a moving body in space. These studies in time inspired artists and architects in later generations to contend with the physicality of the body in its continuous state of flux. Marcel Duchamp, was, uh, for instance, was inspired by one of Moy Bridge's photos when he painted Nude Descending a Staircase. The painting combines <clears throat> elements of both cubist and futurist painting. Uh, in the composition, Duchamp depicts motion by successive superimposed images similar to the stroboscopic uh, motion photography. He depicts uh, <laughs> discernible body parts composed of conical and cylindrical abstract elements assembled together in such a way to suggest rhythm and convey movement of the figure merging into itself. Further in those studies of high-speed photography, Harold Edgerton furthered this work in the latter earlier part of the 20th century, perfecting the medium by using strobe lights and high-speed film to caption even the most ephemeral moments, for instance, a bullet piercing the skin. <clears throat> in this method, time could be captured in the fractions of a second. Around the, the early part of the 20th century, architecture was also starting to contend with this concept of time. While prior principles in architecture from the classical era had been constructed on the notion of symmetry and the Vitruvian man, which generated classical order and rational spatial relationships, those prin principles were now being questioned. Corbusier's development of the modular man conceived of the body in space and its proportions as something that was asymmetrical. I think one of, the, <clears throat> one of his uh, latter projects, uh, the Carpenter Center in Boston, typifies this concept as the procession of a, uh, of a campus walking path piercing through the building as a dynamic exchange with the building itself. It creates a centripetal force where the building seems to acquiesce to the moving body. And while Cor uh, Boo's, Boo was testing this notion with form, Oh, and as you can see, this is the cross section of the Carpenter Center as you move up through the building and the kind of rotational force that it creates. And I think one of the most uh, interesting parts of this building is the way he dynamically uses that motion uh, in an interplay with a material like concrete to create this kind of lightness uh, between the heaviness of the concrete and the transparency of the glass. And this is the path that bisects the building. And while Corb Korb was testing the notion with form, other rationalists of the modern area were testing these concepts with the idea of the open plan. Mises National Gallery creates the opposite of form and instead develops a neutral field in which the body in space becomes the form of the building. The notion of time was amplified with the use of computing in architecture. Architects like Greg Lynn emphasized process rather than the finished form of the building. With his embryological house, he suggests that the home might need to be based on ideas of adaptation or mutation, one that could adjust to the given to conditions rather than take on a state of permanence. More currently in representation, the no notion of mapping and moving bodies through space using data has ex exploded into a field of all its own. Databases create extraordinary terrains and reveal ephemeral forms of our quotidian patterns. In these, I showed the, uh, the Rati drawing last week. This is a drawing uh, by Laura Kurgan, uh, who teaches at Columbia, which studies uh, global shipping patterns. And kind of the interesting part about it is the way they reveal the kind of figure ground uh, of the earth um, and the intensities uh, of where goods are delivered. <clears throat> So I think an architect's practice as it relates to time is most aptly summed up by the late great Michael Sorkin who wrote in his book, Wiggle, fish are symmetrical, but only until they wiggle. Our effort is to measure the space between the fish and the wiggle. This is the study of our lifetime. And I think one of the ways that the architect measures the wiggle is through drawing, specifically in our <clears throat> diagrams and notation. Stan Allen writes in practice, notations are necessarily reductive and abstract, yet the products of notation <laughs> do not necessarily resemble the notation itself. Notation are abstract machines capable of producing new configurations 
out of given materials. They work across gaps of time and space, but they are not universal. They work by means of transposition rather than translation. <clears throat> According to Stan, they define a loosely bound collective domain. Notation is an instrument, not an end of itself. Uh, <clears throat> mapping is another form of representation that often collapses time and image into a series of images. There are many examples of this, and if you're interested in this type of representation, Edward Tufte's Envisioning Information is an excellent uh, primer, uh, the, his book. Tufte documents the evolution of this type of time-based mapping. One of the earliest and most famous examples of this is Charles Minard's map of Napoleon's March on Moscow. <clears throat> the drawing displays variables including time, location, duration, and temperature in a single 2D image to understand the uh, campaign uh, of the French army as it marched to Moscow uh, it, through the treacherous weather, time uh, conditions, and variables, and how the large army returned as just a, a small fraction of its size due to all of these variables. Mapping isolates the most important variable and allows the notation to reveal the form. It can clarify complex uh, relationships in space and time in a single drawing. For instance, notation, you can understand how to move between Hanover and Belgrade uh, through each of the major nodes on the point, and it uses notation of line weight and dashing to help you understand frequency of movement and the speed of travel. It also shows you a variety of different ways in which you can make that trip. Lou Kahn's uh, uh, movement studies uh, for the city of Philadelphia clearly illustrate in a plan diagram how the pedestrian understands the city versus the way a car understands the city. Using just a simple graphical device between ticks and arrows. Map making is used for a wide range, mapping and map making is used for a wide range of representation from charting an egress path to understanding stress strain relationships on a facade. It can be used for everything from uh, quantitative items to qualitative items. Uh, psychogeography was defined in 1955 by Guy Debord as the study of precise laws and specific effects of the geographical environment, consciously organized or not, the emotions and behaviors of individuals. Debor in the Situationist the document, documented the memory of a grieve and remapped the city based on their memories and perceptions, creating a map of cognitive connections rather than physical connections. Constance New Bab Babylon was an anti-established approach to urban planning. Concepts were spatialized and linked as transformable structures that would be populated by a man at play or person at play. Contemporary studies in movement notation even suggest the importance of time as a as, and its disordering is something that should be instrumental in the way that we conceive of space. And uh, Daniel Leavskin did this uh, micro megas project where he looked at time sections where the notation, if you look at this series of uh, drawings, uh, they start with the kind of physicality of a, a space and the notation slowly um, start to uh, basically deconstruct uh, the physical spaces and this kind of uh, one of the, I guess, uh, the seminal sets of drawings that was used as a kind of reference in the development of deconstructivist architectures. So the section. <clears throat> From the manual section uh, by Louis Sermaki Lewis. Because the section begins with the vis visualization of that which will not be directly seen, it remains abstracted from the dominant way of understanding architecture through photographs and renderings. Sections provide a unique form of knowledge, one that by necessity shifts the emphasis from image to performance, from surface to the intersection of structure, and demonstrates the exchange among multiple aspects of the embodied experience in architectural space, making explicit the intersection of scale and proportion, sight and view, <clears throat> touch and reach, that rendered visible in the vertical dimension as opposed from top down. In a section, interior elevation, walls, and surfaces are revealed combining for examination and exploration, structure and ornament, envelope and interior. In this way, the section becomes an extension of the architect's gaze, providing an omni omnipresent occupation of a vertical moment, the ability to occupy many spaces at once and make connections. Architecture as a cut <clears throat> or excavation has been a longstanding fascination for architects. 
using spher spherical, usually spherical in shape, uh, relating to our larger heavenly body and solar system. And as you can see, these kind of uh, historic uh, excavations are things that architects are continually interested in, become kind of a part of our preoccupation with the idea of sectioning. Sectioning is also a conceptual act. They reveal the organisms within. Traditionally, the section, this section relates to how bodies are oriented and thus experienced. The colonnade to the entry, the pediment to the roof, the relationship of form to force, and the vertical arrangement of space, spaces. Sections organize the symbolic function of architecture and its uh, sets of relationships. But sectioning is also a device for revealing secrets. Our techniques of sectioning allow us to inhabit spaces and understand relationships that are complex and sometimes mysterious. We understand our bodies and our, our society much more systemically through section. Sectioning is a scan. They reveal narratives about program relationships, occupancy, and the quotidian, density, They reveal relationships about public space and democracy. Ideas about circulation and contiguity. Sometimes serial sets of relationship in time are shown to, uh, to create a blending of space between those moments. They show relationships in light in our natural environment and the, also the act of performance and being seen. <clears throat> they show layering and events in time. But most importantly, sections are analysis. They are generators for design. <clears throat> They're never just about documentation. They provide architects feedback on the qualitative and quantitative moments of architecture. So finally, with all the emphasis on sectioning, on the vertical axis, I felt compelled to reinforce that plans are two also sections. A plan is just a horizontal section, usually cut at about four feet off of the ground. In this way, your plans should embody similar notions of performance in their construction. They anticipate the action of the body in space, whether it's through a neutral field or, or based on a highly <coughs> prescriptive performance. Both suggest action is a critical flare in the formation of spatial relationships. In particular, and as it relates to this uh, term studio project, I wanted to direct your attention to the idea of the Noli plan. A Noli plan is a device uh, for understanding the democracy of urbanity and its flows. Noli plans reveal the figure ground of a city, city's democratic spaces and essentially create a map that helps the uh, the viewer understand the figure ground of what is accessible and what is private uh, within the city. So that's it on uh, sectioning. Um, for the last uh, little bit of our talk, I wanted to uh, quickly uh, direct our uh, focus onto a precedent project. Um, uh, it's a nearby precedent and one that I was fortunate enough to participate in during its conceptualization and design development, uh, starting with the redevelopment plan uh, in 2004. So I'm going to give you a quick tour uh, for parts of the redevelopment of 65th Street at Lincoln Center uh, by Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro. I felt like this is a very apt precedent uh, for our project given Lincoln Center's challenges uh, with its urban interfaces, which uh, very much mirror some of the challenges that Columbia's campus has. But before I get into the strategic interventions deployed by DSR, I thought I should frame the history of the neighborhood as many of its challenges emanate for, from the original conception of its campus. Now over 50 years old, Lincoln Center's campus might look original to New York City, especially since much of the neighborhood <coughs> development has been rebuilt during that time. However, it was not. Before Lincoln Center was realized, Manhattan City Grid had already established a neighborhood on that 16 acres between 62nd Street and 66th Street on the west side of Manhattan. The neighborhood was known as San Juan Hill. 
Its residents were mostly African-American, African-Caribbean, and Puerto Rican, and comprised one of the largest communities, uh, or largest black communities in New York before, before World War I. Their area also had a cultural legacy. Jazz had thrived in its basement clubs, producing legendary talents such as <clears throat> jazz great Thelonious Monk, who grew up in the neighborhood. Historian Macy uh, S. Sachs wrote that the San Juan Hill had a lot of basement tenement clubs that ranged from dives to higher end clubs, and that were also pool rooms, salons, dance halls, and bordellos. So it's clear it had a very lively <clears throat> character and quality to the neighborhood. The conception of Lincoln Center was a project of, uh, initiative of Governor John Rockefeller III, who later became the inaugural president of Lincoln Center campus <clears throat> when it was incorporated in 1956. It was conceived in a, as an opportunity for the city to create a great cult cultural campus. The campus was built during the city's era of urban renewal, largely driven by the controversial urban planner, Robert Moses. During that area to create modern improvements, the city <clears throat> used a technique of declaring large areas of the city slums in, order, in need of renewal. This was the first step in de deeming an area blighted which would allow the city to reclaim the land via eminent domain. In this city, in this scenario, the city would pay the owners the property, the government's declared value for the land and take ownership under the guise of the project being for the greater good of the community at large. This is Robert Moses. The neighborhood wasn't blighted though. It was a home to an multi-ethnic community of more than 7,000 lower class families and 800 businesses who were immediately displaced by eminent domain, not to mention the countless families who would eventually be displaced from the increased rent costs due to the gentrification once the campus was complete. While the arts and music had previously thrived in San Juan Hill, the new arts complex was, developed, was not developed to build off of that legacy. Instead, it was developed as a clean slate a venue built for the culturally elite, both in its musical orientation and in its urban planning. To build its campus, <clears throat> Lincoln Center establi oh, established an all white team of men to re-envision the neighborhood and create the campus, including Wallace Harrison, who was the leader of the team, his partner, Max Abramovitz, Philip Johnson, Aero Saarinen, Gordon Buncha, and Pietro Beluski. Dan Kiley provided the des designs for the landscape of the North Plaza and Damrush Park. Driven by expectations of its clientele and its elitist orientation, the campus was designed as an island rather than an integral part of the city. Given as an attempt, <clears throat> given as an attempt to try to offset some of the suburbanization happening in the city, the campus decided to privilege the car over the pedestrian. It placed high culture over lived culture. In my opinion, this was the critical flaw of the campus. Rather than take advantage of its most valuable resource, its adjacency to New York City, it instead chose to turn its back on the city. It created an inward focused anti-urban campus. This was no accident. The plinth and the high walls that formed much of the edge were a clear message to the neighborhood <clears throat> who belonged on campus and who didn't belong. This is particularly problematic given the campus was constructed on city property with the notion of being a complex for the city. Although the physicality of the campus clearly reinforced who the campus was intended to serve and who didn't, didn't something, the institution further reinforced this with both its programming and management of the campus through the end of the 20th century. The campus's failure to establish some of the more critical relationships with the city <clears throat> was not unknown. Upon its completion, the campus was immediately criticized for its shortcomings by critics uh, for architecture due to its classical sensibilities and failing to live up to the more democratic ideals of modern architecture. Fast forward to the end of the 20th century, the patronage at Lincoln Center was aging. There were no, <clears throat> no longer, they were no longer attending the campus with regularity and programming for the complex has, had largely failed to incorporate contemporary arts. The campus was becoming a relic. Even worse, the original inward orientation that privileged the car seemed particularly out of step with the resurgence of mass transit and large, uh, urban larger resurgence of urban living. Lincoln Center was struggling to maintain its uh, position as a cultural epicenter. 
Simply put, Lincoln Center <clears throat> was a 40-year-old travertine dinosaur uh, of an institution. Lincoln Center needed to re-envision itself. So via competition, they selected Diller, Scafidio, and Renfro to lead the effort. The challenge was interpreting the monumental architecture of Lincoln Center, <clears throat> respecting its original DNA, but fixing its flaws. This effort led to a series of strategic interventions that insert and update programs and information throughout the campus. This effort redirected its inward focus backward outward towards the city, turning the campus, as I said, inside out. While re-envisioning the campus, <clears throat> while the re-envisioning was campus-wide, uh, I wanted to uh, particularly focus our attention on 65th Street. Lincoln Center's original uh, inception incorporated an exclusionary plinth as an initial act to separate the population to the site. Even more similarly, Lincoln Center used pedestrian used a pedestrian plaza bridge to span over 65th Street to connect the Juilliard campus to the main campus of Lincoln Center. Built in a similar area as, era as Revson Plaza, the Millstein Bridge was exceptional only in its ability to be a terrible urban space. Bleak, both above and below, Millstein Plaza created cover for cars at the expense of urban fabric. Neither, it neither served as a proper entry for Juilliard nor the parking area for Lincoln Center which was notoriously congested and difficult to access. So this is the overall campus. Uh, this is the Juilliard building. This is the North Plaza that we're speaking of. This is 65th Street. And this was the Millstein Bridge, which covered about a third of the actual street. So the first move was to remove, remove Millstein Plaza. So as an initial act, <clears throat> turning Lincoln Center inside out, it was determined that the Millstein Plaza must be removed. The larger goal was to invite the city back into the campus. Reconnecting the institution to the street allowed uh, DSR to activate the street as an extension of the campus and make the campus much more democratic. It brought the 24 seven vitality of the city uh, to the campus, a place that could be active both during performances, but also when venues were not active. The redevelopment of 65th Street started on the north side of the street. With the determination that Millstein Plaza was going to be removed, the design team had to figure out how to reconnect the Juilliard School and Tully Hall to the street. Both were inwardly focused as Belusky, the architect uh, for the original building, had conceived of the building while looking at models of monastic uh, buildings with a very inward focus, intending to basically isolate the students uh, from the uh, greater, its greater environment. In analyzing the building, it became clear the building was, <clears throat> did have a variety of assets that could be tapped into to help the reconnection. Liz Diller described this architectural move as the strip tease. As the heavy travertine facade and plinth were stripped at its base to reveal <clears throat> the theaters uh, within. The theaters were then handsomely reclad and lit to make the program visible to, to the street. The lobby spaces were clad in large expanses of glass and invited the public to enter during non-performance time, providing cafes and restaurants for both formal and informal dining. At the corner of 65th Street and Broadway, a similar technique was used, but Juilliard needed to extend its program too. So instead of extending the plinth, DSR expanded overhead, creating a large public plaza beneath. Also, rather than hiding the school's activities, it instead decided <clears throat> to section the program, showing off its activities to the public. In particular, the dance rehearsal studio was peeled down from its prow to reveal itself to the street, and the sidewalk reciprocated the peel, creating a bleacher for the public to occupy and even cap cap capture a glimpse of what was happening on the inside. So this is the plaza that was created when the extension of the Juilliard School came out to meet Broadway. And the dance rehearsal studio basically hung, hangs down in the face uh, of the plaza and uh, protrudes out from the facade. And there's a bleacher that allows the public to come and just sit uh, as they're passing by or uh, taking a break and actually watch the uh, performances, the informal performances uh, of the campus, which is a pretty exciting way to kind of create uh, a dynamic relationship between building and street. So, 
This is the original building and then the re-envisioning by uh, Dillard's Studio and Renfro. And this is the dance studio that I mentioned in the bleacher. A similar perspective from looking on 65th Street. And this is the section and how that actually all played out. And this is the view looking from the inside out backwards toward, towards Broadway. The kind of notion of <clears throat> uh, coming to see a performance and being part of the performance was a big part of the discourse uh, as it relates to the project. And this is how it uh, currently exists. <clears throat> so the other challenge of removing the Milstein Bridge presented was the introduction <clears throat> of noise to the North Plaza. It also uh, created a challenge as Juilliard's entry had to be re-envisioned re as the campus had long ago abandoned its street level for the entry at Milstein Plaza. So DSR proposed pulling the entrance back down to the street with a grand staircase. This reconnected the lobby to the street and to facilitate this, uh, DSR proposed allowing the program of the lobby to cascade down the stair, creating a bleacher lobby hybrid which encouraged students to hang out rather than just pass through. The other challenge uh, as it related to noise uh, was uh, over on the North Plaza, which had traditionally been uh, a very quiet space and it was used for outdoor performances. So on this side of the street, DSR chose to close up the existing poorly functioning car drop off and to instead use, it, use program to reactivate the street. Wanting to create an insertion that would maintain some of the tranquility of the North Plaza while simultaneously activating the street, they proposed a campus screen. But the campus screen needed to perform <clears throat> both as a sound barrier and something that would activate the street. It had to serve two purposes. So D DSR used a hyperbolic paraboloid uh, formed campus screen to be both restaurant and campus screen. The form allowed them to tuck the program underneath the campus screen, creating activity and serenity in one section. Further down the street, well, and these are some images uh, of the North Plaza, and this is the kind of reconceptualization of the entirety of the 65th Street uh, with the high par uh, roof lawn, the restaurant, they uh, put the Film Society program was underneath uh, uh, the restaurant, uh, there's a grand staircase which was opened up to provide greater access to the redesigned North Plaza. Uh, this is the Tully Plaza and Juilliard extension. And then uh, the final piece was further down the street. It was determined that a pedestrian bridge uh, was required to facilitate the transportation of its youngest uh, audience members. And here are some images uh, just looking across the North Plaza. So further down the street, it was determined that a pedestrian bridge was required to facilitate the transportation of the youngest performers from the American School of Ballet to the main campus. <clears throat> However, uh, that necessity to, um, rather than allow that bridge to dominate, BSR proposed a light bridge. And using their typical exhaustive research, uh, they studied every possible uh, potential in that bridge in order to create the lightest, a most dynamic bridge uh, that could span at a diagonal across the, the uh, 65th Street. As you can see, uh, studying a really wide range of potentials uh, in the way that they typically do. The final bridge elegantly spans across the street connecting the two clunk levels. And the final thing uh, I wanted to cover is in addition to the big moves, uh, DSR also paid significant attention to the small details of the campus in order to reactivate the street. One of Lincoln Center's biggest challenges with the act was that the activities within weren't reaching a broad enough audience. So DSR used the street as a way to showcase the, the campus's dynamic activity. Uh, <clears throat> from the use of blades to dynamic programming on the stairs using LEDs that would move across the surface of the stair as you walked up. Uh, DSR made significant e efforts to curate uh, the small moves of the campus uh, and build anticipation of what was happening within uh, each of the venues. I think the understanding of the campus uh, needed, I think the understanding that the campus needed to operate at multiple scales and in section is why the redevelopment was so successful. 
they were both able to breathe new life into the campus by facil facil facilitating the city to return to the campus. It was the understanding that the elite arts has to include everyone to be truly elite that the conversation becomes more interesting when we create multinodal open networks rather than create islands. Okay, now that is it. Um, thanks everyone for your time.